Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2016 edition of Thought Spots. It's the opening event for the Festival of Teaching. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Um, as our host for tonight, uh, we should introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Shani Murhedge. Uh, I just recently applied for graduation from my degree. So I don't have a degree yet, but it is pending. Uh, <laughs> for the past three months. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I'm Eric. I will also eventually have a science degree, but my end date is a lot more nebulous. I don't actually know when it's coming. I don't know what my minor is. It's going to be an interesting few years. Yeah, um, so we have a lot of experience uh, in the classroom. My degree can take four years, so I have five years under my belt. Eric, you have? Five years. No, four years. I'm going into my fifth year. So we have nine, nine collective years of learning experience, and so we're not teaching experts. But I think you could say we're learning experts. Um, yeah, so we were thinking about this the other day, and we've decided we really like to be entertained. I read a pretty snarky article about millennials in the work or in the school place, and turns out I'm Generation Z, and apparently that's even worse than a millennial. And I really, really, really love to be entertained. You don't have to juggle, but maybe you could tell jokes. That would be cool. Yeah, I don't know if you spent more than three minutes, <laughs> uh, so you have to work with that. Um, Another tip is I need clear expectations. Um, so you can't tell me that the final's cumulative, and then I'll be testing on the last two things you got because that's not cumulative. <laughs> Um, I also really, really like it when I feel like you hear me. I want to ask you lots of questions, but you can ask me questions every once in a while. Yeah, and uh, you've got to be each other's time. I don't think I'm your office hours, and Say something to take five minutes in the stand room for 30. So we have a 50 minute lecture and take an hour and 10 minutes. Clearly, this is not a two way street. <laughs> And speaking of time, that's something we're going to be paying attention to today. Um, all of our presenters only have five minutes to be able to make it through all of their content. That's right, Eric. The ones we have gone through the entire five minutes. A green university of Alberta Bell. Is this sold at the bookstore? No. <laughs> So rule number three is all of our presenters are going to be racing the clock. Um, so they have an iPad in front of them that will let them know the time as we go through. And that's all of the rules. Uh, we, we just have one more. Oh, one more? Yeah, so if you have questions, save until the end. Yeah. That was a good spell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so please, if you have any questions, uh, do save them uh, for the end of the event. I'm sure whoever questions for will be here. Well, happy to answer it. Um, so let's talk a little about who's going to be presenting. Uh, each person today has won an award for their excellence in front of a class, so we're pretty sure they'll be able to illustrate some good tips of teaching. Yeah, so we'd like to welcome up our first presenter, Dr. Jana Greckel, to get everything started. Uh, good evening, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I want to share with you this, this evening an experiment that I had with my Sociology of Punishment course, a fourth year course. I implement, Im implemented project-based learning into the course for the first time. Project-based learning is inductive inquiry-based learning um, where students collaborate to develop authentic artifacts that represent their learning. Why did I do it? Well, traditionally, I taught the course as a tr uh, sort of a traditional seminar lecture course. And what I found is that students would often come to class having not prepared their readings. And so that resulted in not a lot of good engagement in class and a lot of awkward silences. So I really wanted to try to something that would engage them in a different way. As a result of my uh, work with April, Arts Pedagogy Research and Innovation Lab, I was exposed to project-based learning. Now this is something that I know a lot of people use in their teaching, um, in a lot of other faculties and departments, but it was new to me. So it was kind of a, an interesting experiment for me to try out. What did it look like in the course? Quite simply, there were no readings, assigned readings. There was no textbook. I lectured about four times throughout the term. And the course really depended a lot on student group work. The way I uh, structured the course was according to a theme. The theme was get tough on crime legislation and how it impacts the punishment of certain groups in society. 
Aboriginal peoples, women, people with mental health issues, families, gangs, and that sort of thing. So students were assigned to those themes. They produced two major projects in the class. One was an academic lecture. The second was a, a final project that could be whatever they wanted it to be as long as it built on the academic lecture. So what I wanted to do today is just share with you some of the lessons learned and reflections that I have based on this experiment. Um, and oh, I should mention the quotes that I'm using are from students. It was from reflective assignments that they produced throughout the term and I have their consent to use these quotes. I think they really illustrate my points well. First of all, it was a really risky, risky thing for all of us, for my students and for myself. Risky for me because I was teaching in a way that I had never taught before and that was really scary to me. I worried about whether students would resist, whether they'd hate it, whether the course would flop. Um, students, their riskiness, the risk for them seemed to really center around group work. And I think most of us know that group work gets a pretty bad reputation and for good reason. And so that was, the bulk of their mark was going to be based on group work, so they were freaking out. We did a couple of things that helped make group work work in this course. First of all, we had early on in the course a really open and honest class discussion about the pros and cons of group work and what some strategies are to make it work. The second thing is that students had a lot of input into the groups that they ended up working in. So that really went a long way to help with the course. Student engagement was phenomenal. Uh, they ended up putting more work and time into this course than they do when I teach it the traditional way. I learned from my students new material, which was fantastic. In terms of commitment, attendance was almost perfect. And when students were not attending because they were ill, they were Facebooking or texting with their group members so that they could contribute. Anecdotally, several students confided in me that they were so concerned about their group members that they worked harder than ever because they didn't want to be responsible for their group members getting a lower mark than they deserved. So there was a lot of commitment and engagement on the part of students. And I owe a lot of that to what I think was the creation of a safe space. The class was very positive, very encouraging, and very supportive. So students felt safe to do presentations and to interact with each other. We embarked on this really as a team, a team that I, I encouraged them, let's do this together. This is something new. And so we really embodied that teamwork approach. Um, quality of the final projects were phenomenal. And I invite you, I'm running out of time, so I invite you to check out our April website where there's a short video on this class where the students themselves actually talk about the class and their projects. So please do check it out if you're interested in seeing more about the projects. But just a couple examples. One group actually wrote a storybook for children whose parents are incarcerated, touching on the kinds of issues that those children would be dealing with. Um, another a couple of groups also tended their final projects moved in the direction of game shows to engage students, which was a lot of fun. And uh, another group, this is just a sample of some of them, the game of life, the social class students, the students that were looking at how social class affects punishment, modified the game board, game of life, to look at... Damn. Thank you. <laughs> That was an inappropriate conclusion. I should have said. Okay, thank you very much to uh, allow me to have a few minutes to talk to you about Carry On Got It, which is a uh, topic I'm not going to explain to you until halfway through this talk, which is two minutes from now, and maybe even our students can pay attention for that long. So <laughs> just to push back a little bit there. Um, I will be talking about how we teach in busy workplace environments. And there's a growing international movement in medicine called competency-based medical education. And I'm going to try to tell you about it without getting into a lot of the language. And I'm going to do that by telling you the three recommendations throughout the literature and at most conferences, which say that in our busy clinical workplaces, our students deserve to be observed more often as they interact with patients and team members. They deserve better feedback and better coaching on a day-to-day -day basis, and they do deserve to have a documentation of some of that observation and feedback, which is collected and then stored in a properly organized portfolio, which probably should be electronic. So I'm going to tell you about a tool that we developed here at the University of Alberta to try to address those recommendations called Field Notes, 
which comes, as you know, from the qualitative research methodology. But in our context, what a field note is, is when we're actually asking a busy clinician or any of the healthcare team to take the time to write down the feedback that they've just given to a learner. And it's feedback about a specific event. Now I'm going to show you an example of a field note from a busy family doc here in Edmonton who was working with a first year family medicine resident. And the resident has just come out from seeing a patient with arthritis in one knee. So every field note has a title, just enough to find that note later on. And then the most important part of the field note is the actual narrative content. And it's not a description of the event, it's the specific feedback that was given. And in this case, the teacher thought that this resident did a very good job in diagnostic reasoning. And so instead of just saying good job, the teacher has written down, these are the diagnoses I heard you consider and I really like the way you prioritize them. Now every note ends with a judgment. And there are three levels. Stop important correction means there's a lot to improve. In progress means you did some of this right, but I'm gonna also tell you how you could have done better. And carry on got it is positive reinforcement. And again, not just good job, but here's what I really liked, okay? So now you know what carry on got it's about. Um, you may ask yourself, how many notes are in these different categories? So if you look on your left, uh, the bar graphs show that consistently about 5% of notes are in the stop important correction category and the rest are split just about evenly between in progress and carry on got it. Now I want to contrast that for you with on your right a typical form where it's meets expectations or exceeds expectations or average, above average. It's always the case, almost always, that there's a halo effect and the teachers are not differentiating between what was done well or what wasn't done well. Now the next question you may ask is, will busy clinicians actually take the time to enter a sample of the teaching that they do? So we've been using an electronic version of this for six years now and our average number of notes received on our residents is 6,000 a year, like the one I just showed you. So what I want to conclude with is that I'm trying to show you that competency education in the workplace is feasible, but it has to be designed with the fourth recommendation in the literature, which I've saved for last, which is we should design assessment of learning, but especially design assessment for learning, and then people will use it. Thank you very much. So I uh, teach a large number of classes in a large variety. So I teach introductory biochemistry, which can have 350 students, then a 300 metabolism course, which can have 100, and they're slightly higher level, then a fourth year lab course, which is very intimate with 10 students, sometimes 15, and then I do study abroad, so I coordinate our students going abroad, and then I teach DL for um, medicine. So I teach a lot of science students with some uh, medical students. And every year that we came to do our annual report, there's a section that says you're teaching philosophy and I never felt it out. And I think it's because when I started teaching, I had no training in teaching. I just did it because I realized I liked interacting with people, but I had no training. I didn't love spending time in the lab by myself working away. And so I didn't feel I had a teaching philosophy and I never did. I always got away without doing it. I'm like, phew, another year and I didn't have to write my teaching philosophy. And then it came from my final promotion to FSO4 and I was told, you need to do a teaching philosophy. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't have one. Like, what am I going to do? So one day I said, well, I'm going to write down what I do in each class. And so I sat down and I wrote about what I did in Biochem 200 and how I felt these were newer students to the university. They were scared sometimes doing biochemistry because maybe 2% wanted to do the course and the rest were forced to do the course. And so I realized I took that into consideration and I made myself available to these students and I tried not to intimidate them and I tried to be open to them and always allow them to come to my office no matter what the time was or what their um, situation was. And then I realized that as I moved into the 300, I started to expect more and I was able to communicate that because the students have been with me in the 200. And then I realized when I went into the 400 that I was able to expect more and they were much more willing to give it to me and they came to trust me. 
And then moving on to study abroad, I realized that I was able to help them move out into foreign countries where sometimes they'd never even left Alberta, a couple of the students, and they trusted me enough to be able to do that. So after writing it, I realized, you know, I actually do have a philosophy, even though I wasn't fully aware, and so many teachers when they're starting off now come and ask me, and I just say, just sit down and do it and spend the time. And so that made me realize, you know, maybe I do deserve the award, because I always feel like, oh, maybe I don't deserve the award. What have I done? And what I really realized I've done is, I've realized teaching is not just teaching them nitrogens and hydrogen bonds and nucleotides and amino acid groups, but it's a social aspect too. And that it's something that has been going on for 400 years, a teacher and a student interacting together. And for me, that's been very important and it's something I value very much. And when I look at the comments I get, a lot of times they will say that is they can come and talk and that Technology is great, and I love it, and I've used clickers in Biochem 200 to try and communicate with the students. And when I started off using clickers, I was like, okay, I'm going to show them the hardest questions, and I'm going to prepare them for the exam. And I gave them, I went through all my multiple choice questions with the hardest. And what I realized, all I did was I scared them. And they're like, oh, they were freaked out of the exam. Questions are all going to be like this. And so by talking to the students and listening to them and getting their feedback, I realized Sometimes they just want fun questions. Like one time I thought I saw a rat coming up from Calgary and we had a whole big discussion, you know, do we have rats in Alberta? And that opens up the friendship and if students trust you, they can be afraid not to make a mistake. And that's important as a teacher too. If you trust your students, you can do stuff and be, not be afraid to make a mistake. So to me it's a very social interaction between student and teacher and it's something that I'm learning from as I go on. And, Hopefully they're trusting me more and I'm trusting them more and um, I think I've beaten the time. That's really all I had to say. So, during a trip to Spain past reading week, I made sure to stop by the Real Madrid football club store in my hometown. I wanted to purchase several postcards and collectible cards for my students. At the time, I was preparing a lesson plan that involved an activity in which students had to find the fastest, fastest subway route to the football stadium in Madrid using an authentic subway pamphlet that I had brought with me in Spanish. The winners would receive either a collectible card or a postcard with a soccer player in it. The entire class was thrilled. They were preparing for the activity as if it was the final of the Champions League of Soccer. <laughs> what was even more thrilling for me was the fact that they became so engaged with the topic, not only completing the tasks, but asking constant questions on the culture of soccer in the Spanish world. I clearly remember one particular student that kept asking me all sorts of questions. How do you say Cristiano Ronaldo is the worst in Spanish? Or Messi is the greatest on earth? And for her and the class, all of a sudden, soccer became a bridge to a culture and a language. Now, I must emphasize that a language class is different in several ways to a content course. For one, students are constantly challenged to express themselves in a language that is not their own sharing ideas, likes, dislikes, not only to their peers, but even their instructor. I found that one way to make, to ease the situation, which is very vulnerable to students at times, is to take a topic in which they have a, curio a curiosity about. The truth is, is that most students that enroll in a language class do so because they have a, an intrigue of the culture of a specific language. So, for example, in Spanish, most of our students are, that come into our class are in love with Hispanic music, Hispanic food, the sporting events. So I took this to heart and I prepared several sessions on soccer and the Spanish world. I would like to share with you briefly one of the experiences. So, one of the, in the lesson plan, I planned for several activities in which students I projected images of soccer players and fans, and they had to discuss with their peers what those players or fans were feeling at that moment. And then after 
discussing several images, I showed an image of Diego Maradona scoring his famous goal in the World Cup of 1986. In that image, you can see Diego Maradona trying to head the ball in, but quite blatantly putting his hand and pushing the ball into the goal. In the Hispanic world, that goal is aptly titled La Mano de Dios, the God of Hand, the, man, the Hand of God. <laughs> so, at first I asked the students to describe the image in as much detail as they can, describe what's going on, the objects. And then I open the discussion and I say, what do you think La Mano de Dios means? Usually I get students with confused looks saying, mm, are you in that you know, the literal translation makes no sense at all. What in the world does God have to do with soccer and Maradona anyways? But some students begin to connect the dots and help the rest of the class connect the connection between soccer and religion in the Hispanic world. And then I show them this image, which is a comic strip. The language in it is very simple. Any beginning student in Spanish can understand what is said. The trick, though, is understanding something that goes beyond the literal sense, the actual cultural context. And I can't tell you how incredible it is to see the light, students light up when they start connecting and understanding the religious status of Maradona to the Argentinian Pope when he tries to take his name when he takes the Pope. <laughs> and just the look of surprise is incredible. And every time I teach this lesson, I become all the more convinced on the importance of bringing culture into the language class. Not only does it motivate students, but it also makes them more aware of their own culture. And this, I believe, is very important. The language class is not about trying to create native speakers, but rather into helping students make the transit back and forth from a culture and a language. Thank you. I'm calling it pedagogical pecha coup because a regular pecha kuche is six minutes and 40 seconds and I don't have enough time for that. So <laughs> there are going to be 20 slides for 15 seconds each. For those of you that aren't familiar with what pecha kuche is, I'll talk about it in a second. And the pedagogical part is obvious because I'm in the faculty of ed. So the next Edmonton Pecha Kucha night is on June 5th. If you want to go and present, you can still uh, put your name forward. And it's a, a worldwide phenomenon that started in Japan. Some designers decided that they couldn't stand listening to other designers and architects talk interminably. So they created this format so that they'd have to be concise as they presented their new ideas. And you can use this in your classes for yourself, to make yourself. Um, teach things in chunks, and also to get your students to teach things in ways that won't make you want to stab your eyes out after they've <laughs> talked a half hour. Now, I teach teachers, which is as intimidating as this evening is for me. I was pretty nervous, and I've, over 35 years, seen enough faces like that. But um, student teachers are even worse. They're nervous about seeing this kind of behavior in their classes. And one of the most memorable things that I get them to do, at least they say it's memorable, is teach micro lessons. And they get to be the bad kids and role play for their colleagues. This is one of the things that I get them to do that fits in with this model that the person who's teaching is the one that's learning the most in the classroom. At least that's what I've found from experience. I also get them to lead movement breaks because I think that two hours is way too long to be sitting down without moving and to do icebreakers and energizers. And this gets them to be involved in that middle section of the gradual release of responsibility. I find that as adults, teaching adults, we often just skip from focused instruction to independent learning without any steps in between. Um, I've learned over the years that it's important to think about your teaching metaphors, and I get my student teachers to think about this as well. And I've realized in the past few years that my metaphor that I work with isn't actually any of these. It's teacher as host. I don't think I teach them really much of anything. I just create an environment where maybe they can figure it out and the environment matters. It's been hard for me teaching at the university. I'm on secondment. I'm used to teaching in high school where I can control the way the room is set up and I can have a tea station. And now I have to take my perk in the elevator every day as I go to class. 
One of the formats that I love to teach in as a result that fits with my philosophy is World Cafe. And if you're not familiar with it, you can Google it. There's lots of information. But it's a way of making sure that you can have conversations that matter. And I think this is the hardest skill as a teacher, is leading effective discussion, and yet it's the most rewarding. This is a picture of my student teachers in a World Cafe format. You'll see different colored tablecloths. And typically, the tablecloths are set up so that the students write, or the participants write right on them. Uh, you'll have refreshments, even if you don't normally at any other time. And you circulate from table to table, leaving one student as a host each time that the group moves and mingles. It's really great for taking a conversation on a topic deeper each time you move and you consider the question more deeply. You also usually don't just write words, as in that picture, but you also have graphic recording. So lots of pictures will appear on the paper as well. I add a few things to my World Cafe. I put all kinds of objects in the center of the table for them to have to think creatively about how they would use them in teaching. Uh, puppets are one of the things that you would be surprised. When they come in, they say, we're secondary teachers. Why do, I, why do you have all these things? But I can't get the puppets out of their hand by the time they leave. <laughs> now, this is all part of going multimodal, which I think is so important. And we all do that with our PowerPoint presentations. But next week, I'm going to be teaching a spring session course where we'll do visual journaling, like in that last picture. And it all fits within a model of universal design for learning, another idea that education has borrowed from the field of architectural design. So you can Google that too if you want to learn more about it. Now, my main area of interest, which I did my master's on, is mindfulness and contemplative practice, although I look like this woman more often than not. And so it's as intimidating to do uh, workshops on mindfulness as it is on teaching. I'm doing a sales pitch here on my master's project, which is now available on the education resource, in the education resource archives because I put resources in there in all of those four areas, things that I've used in the classroom um, to, to cultivate uh, mindfulness. And there is a mindfulness community of practice here on campus. So if you contact Billy Streen, who's in phys ed, there are faculty from all kinds of uh, disciplines that work together and uh, try to support ways that we can do this in our own classrooms. So if I only said one thing in the entire talk, it would be this. Uh, I think that's what matters most as far as teaching, and the rest will all just come along. Thank you. All right, thank you. So uh, I think I'm the imposter here. Um, all these people actually do really great things. I, I learned so much from listening to them talk about what they do. Uh, but I'm going to share with you my ideas about um, how teaching can actually work in improving the student experience. I've been at the university here for a very long time. I've been involved in all kinds of uh, uh, committees and uh, sessions about how to improve the student experience, and I think teaching is one way to do that. So my approach is to use traditional, well-established methods, uh, specifically the lecture, uh, as a way to convey information to my students and to bring that into the modern classroom. Uh, I think the lecture gets uh, um, a lot of crap these days about how it's not very effective, about how you know you can't sit in front of a class of 300 people, 200 people, and be and communicate anything useful. Uh, and I, I like to challenge that. I think it's actually still useful. It is the most well-established way of communicating in the classroom. But I think there are some things that make it difficult in the modern classroom. And that's what I work on. That's where my teaching sits at. So what do we know about the modern classroom? Uh, I, I, did a, I wrote down what I thought about the modern classroom. And I did a, a poll with some of my colleagues today. And we all agreed on these three things. Large class sizes is technology-based, by which I mean that we use technology for it. But you know, anytime I walk into a classroom, I teach 60 students in the law school and 130 in the, school of in the faculty of pharmacy. And whenever I walk in, there's computers everywhere. And I'm, I have to share my time with Facebook, Twitter, and all the other stuff that students are looking at. And then lastly, it, is, it tends to be sterile, disconnected, and impersonal. That's, those are some of the things I think most, many of us would agree uh, characterize the modern classroom. So what I do is I use the lecture method in the modern classroom, and I use it in ways I think solve all those things that I just listed about the modern classroom. Uh, the first thing is I, I use effective communication methods, uh, and that's just by just being my charming self. You know, I, I, I pace around the classroom, I dress well for class, uh, I try to use humor uh, as a way to reach my students. Um, lawyers are great communicators, and I'm a lawyer, so by default, I communicate well. Um, I use something called assessment-based learning techniques, which really uh, Ken here is responsible for. He taught me how to do it, 
I'm still doing it. Uh, I'm still, you know, a, a, a novice in doing it, but I'm getting better, and I'll talk about that shortly uh, in a second. And uh, lastly, I use tutorials and small cohort assignments, similar to what you do, project-based learning, as a way of uh, breaking up the classroom into smaller groups and engaging more deeply with my students and with the content. So with respect to communication, I quite like this quote about communication. Uh, it's different from information. It's about getting through. If you stand in front of people and you're not able to get through to them, you may be saying things, but if at the end of the day they don't take anything out of that classroom, I think you failed as an instructor. And this is a, a, a battle. You're fighting for time with a lot of things. The attention span, computers, all kinds of things. I even want to check my phone when I'm teaching. I understand the situation. So what I'm trying to do when I go into a classroom is to win that battle. And I do it in all kinds of ways. I'm trying to get their buy-in. Like I said before, uh, I do everything. You know, I, I will cheat, I will terrorize, I will destroy, I will do anything <laughs> to get their attention, to get them to focus on me and what I'm saying. I try to create strong relationships with my students inside and outside of the classroom. And the previous speakers have talk, talked about this as well. You have to have a relationship with them. They have to see you as someone who's interested in learning from them and in teaching them, and they have to respect you. You have to make them personal, personal, um, and you have to be responsive to their interests and to their feedback. I do it in a variety of ways, and I can talk about this during the question period. Uh, for the uh, assessment-based learning, it's a complicated thing that involves me using the uh, assignments and the tests that I give to them and learning from that. So I, I look at those assignments and I ask myself, why are my good students not doing well in these areas? That says something about my teaching. I take that and put that back into my, the way I structure my course, and I focus on those areas where my students are not doing really well. And then lastly, the face time. This really is the cornerstone of what I do today as a teacher. I, for these two classes that I teach that are large classes, I break them up into smaller groups, uh, and sometimes I can't meet with all of them, uh, but I give them assignments that I can work on together. In the law school, I actually meet with them, I do tutorials, and I engage deep, more deeply with the material and with them, and ensure that they understand the material and that I am actually getting through and communicating effectively. And uh, I do have a sixth slide, but that's to say thank you for having me here, and uh, uh, you're welcome to ask questions and I'll answer them. Thank you. This is actually my last lecture at the U of A. I was just hired at the U of R. So I get to give a last lecture. No, that's not fair, that's not fair. I get that back. Um, uh, a few years ago, Neil Hovey, who's hiding in the back, told me that um, the idea of tension that I talked about in my teaching philosophy was really interesting. I should expand on it. I cheated. I sort of did, but I didn't say what it was. And so when I had to decide on the topic, I thought, let's talk about how I create tension in a classroom. There are basically a lot of things that I want to teach my students. Most of them they can actually learn by themselves now, so what's the point? What, what might they have to come to me to learn? What might they ask a philosopher, a social scientist, uh, that's my trade, that's what I'm getting paid for, right? Um, what can they ask me that they couldn't ask anyone else? Well, first of all, I teach them substance. Right? Why do people migrate here? Why do people move here? Why do people still, still speak here? Why do they still uh, speak Francais? Um, why might they not? Why am I speaking in English right now? Um, why do we call this Treaty 6 territory? Why do we acknowledge that we are in Treaty 6 territory? These are the kinds of, this is the stuff of Canadian politics. It's the stuff of political philosophy, the substance of it. Students are actually already immersed in this stuff, in this substance, in this social, political, ideal substance. They interact with other people, they use ideas, they receive ideas, they give them out without even realizing. How do I give them any kind of a chance to be truly act active and engaged in these processes? To be responsible for the consequences of what they do without even trying or knowing that they're doing it? I disturb in a good way. I disturb the common notions, the habits that quiet them, that pacify students, that reassure them. I create tension. I stretch them in opposite directions. Most of the time, I really only have to point out the tensions that already exist in their lives. Simply knowing that there are other perspectives, other positions, 
help students think about their own in a new way. So they get to know the other positions, they get to know their own positions, but differently. Other times they get to place students in front of other experiences, so other perspectives. That makes them uncomfortable because they didn't think of that. They realized new things about themselves that they wish they didn't know. They get to see how others affect them, how they already affect others, and how they might affect them better, differently. Either way, tensions occur, tensions that created the positions where they already stand. They can only see their own position by stepping outside of it. When they use the imagination, when they imagine what it's like to be somewhere else, to say different things, to believe and argue for different things than they usually do, when they use their imagination in this way, they are in two places at the same time. And neither of these places is where they'll end up at the end of the process or where they started from. So the beauty of human beings is that we always take on new forms. And other people help us do that. The second thing I teach them is style. <laughs> yes, like that. What do we do with all this stuff, all this substance? Right? So I make students new, do new things. They learn action verbs, but they also begin and end by reading books. That's technology too. By writing text, that's technology. By saying words, by thinking about themselves and what makes them. I use the analogy of tension as stretching. I'm going to use the analogy of tension as electricity now. Here tension occurs because there's a rearrangement of the elements, the particles around them. Right? It gives us energy to do something that hasn't been done before. So some students get, absolutely enough, energized. They see the world around them rearranging, things are burning up, new things appear. They find room to do something new, to say what they've never thought of thinking before. But for that to happen, they have to be faced with a question. What does this mean to you? What's going on with you right now? It has to be oblique. Electricity can't be seen. So I ask questions that make them connect new elements in ways that I didn't do. I asked those on exams. I made them come up with their own questions for their own assignments. Sometimes students get shocked. They get too much outside energy. They have no conduit for it. That's my role to help them um, use it. But it's all about style at this point. Students, like teachers, learn from others to convey ideas. They need good, simple, clear examples to follow. So I have to be in touch with myself. <laughs> and that's it. All right. Welcome to the first day of chemistry. We're going to be starting on a journey today, but we're also starting on a relationship. It's an intimate relationship, but not intimate in the emotional sense, and certainly not intimate in the physical sense. It's going to be intimate in the intellectual sense and in the experiential sense. We're going to be on this journey of learning together chemistry, and everything we're going to learn about in chemistry over the course of this year is being done in this very first day. So if you can tell me all the chemistry, you can pass this course. There's many roles that you're going to think about for me. You're going to think about me sometimes as a parent, but I'm not a parent. You're going to think about me sometimes as a friend, but I'm not a friend. I'm neither a parent nor a friend, but I'm going to support you as much as I can in your learning, just like a parent or a friend does. You're going to think of me sometimes as the enemy. <laughs> and sometimes you're going to think of me as a jerk. <laughs> but I'm neither one of those either. But sometimes I'm going to challenge you like your enemies and your jerks in your life do. Most of all, I'm your teacher. And the teacher encompasses all of these things. And I want to make sure that we understand that. One of the ways that I might challenge you is I might not ask you questions, but I might give you the answer and ask you to come up with the question. And I'm going to ask you this, or do this to you, because in science, like in life, sometimes you're judged on the quality of the questions you ask, not on the answers you give. And the question for this, or the answer is that four-letter <laughs> word. And I'm going to guide you on this. We're going to have practice. This is not correct, because it's not even in alphabetical order. Okay? So that's wrong. It's OK to say that this is a molecular formula for the salt of silver and chloride. 
And that's a pretty good answer, but a better answer would be what is the only halogen salt that precipitates out with a coinage metal? Because that's a two-step answer. And you have to figure out what a halogen and a coinage metal are. And an even better answer is this one here. Okay? So I'm going to give you guidance as we go through this. But I'm going to challenge you. But I know you can do it. I know that because you are the music makers. And you are the dreamers of the dream. <laughs> now, when I started teaching, I thought that every student was the same. I thought that if I took my knowledge and taught perfectly, I would transfer that knowledge as is in a perfect manner to every student in the class exactly the way that I knew it. But I've since learned that my knowledge is colored by your experience in different ways. And so that the knowledge I give you is different for different students. It's not wrong, it's just in a different context. I've since learned that trying to teach every student the same way leads to a pretty predictable result. <laughs> I've since learned that our education is really about transformation. Oh, crap. And that I can take something like your previous knowledge, which is dirty and unrefined like carbon. <laughs> and if I teach hard enough, I can convert that. Keep up, swivel. I can convert that to perfect little, come on. Perfect little diamonds. And if I teach really hard, very beautiful diamonds. <laughs> but it's not really about me teaching and you learning. It's really about a collaboration. Caitlin? And that if teachers and students work together, we're both illuminated by the light of knowledge. And finally, I've realized that sometimes I have to do very little, and I'm really just a catalyst for the learning explosion. that happens in students. <laughs> and I want you to remember that it's never about the destination, it's never about the grade, it's about this journey we have together, this learning journey together. Thank you very much.